Parents have you ever given your child permission to fight back their bullies? My son was born with a condition called pectus excavatum. In layman's terms, his chest is sunken in. His condition was so bad that he only had two and a half inches between his sternum and his spine and his heart and lungs were bruised because of it. In December, he had surgery to correct it and they put two nickel bars in his chest to give it space and train his bones to grow correctly. About three weeks after his surgery, a kid punched him and dislodged the top bar and he had to have another surgery to put the bar back in place. The kid has been through a lot. Well, the doctor cleared him for most activity last week, just no skateboarding or bike riding but he could now lift his backpack and go hang out with friends and play pickup, non-contact sports. Unbeknownst to me, a kid in his class had been bullying him all semester. And because my son was afraid of getting hit again, he just took it. Well, the evening he was cleared he came to me and said, Dad, I'm cleared now. A kid has been bullying me and hitting me for months. Can I kick his butt? Well, my son isn't really a fighter. He's fought with his brothers but never anyone else, and he's always gotten his butt kicked. So I just figured he was just talking. But this is the first I had heard about the bullying and I was concerned. I could tell he was distressed about the situation so I told him to knock the effer out. He just nodded and went to his room. Now, his older brother is as tough sob. He had a traumatic brain injury two years ago and he missed a year of school so he's in the same grade and coincidentally takes the same class. I talked to him about it and told him to handle it but don't get in trouble. He told me that the kid walks in every day and punches my son in the head. I asked him why he allowed that to happen and he said he wanted his brother to get tough and once he was tired of getting hit, he would do something. About it. While I kinda agree with his thinking, I instructed him to handle it without getting in trouble. The next morning I took them both to school then drove back home to get my younger daughter who goes to a different school that starts later. On the way to take her to school, my wife calls me. Have you taken XXXXX to school yet? Well, after you do, go pick up your son. He got in a fight. I just assumed it was my oldest son. Imagine my surprise when I walked into the school office to see my younger son with a grin from ear to ear. He was beaming. He pointed to another kid sitting in a chair holding an ice pack on his face. I warned him. I was so proud. He had walked into class, sat down, and the kid popped him in the head like always. My older son got up to intervene and before he could, my son decked the kid with one punch. He said the kid was bawling on the floor and that it was the best day of his life. He got suspended for three days. Here's one of Ferrari's miracle moments. In one of Ferrari's darkest seasons, F1 legend Mario Andretti produced a fairy tale moment on its hallowed home ground at Monza, and he did it as a super sub. In the tragic 1982 season where Ferrari lost Gio Vilner its older, and then Didio Peroni's F1 career was ended by a horrible crash at Hockenheim, the team had run one car at the previous two races before Monza. But it couldn't do that at home, especially with the Constructors' Championship still on the line. So Enzo Ferrari called Andretti, who had raced for Ferrari a decade earlier, to make a comeback after a year out of F1. Andretti said accepting the offer wasn't so much a favor to Ferrari as a favor to himself, and he stunned the home fans by claiming pole position, which he converted into a respectable third place on race day. And now you can write more F1 history with Andretti, who is one of several legends that have been added to the F1 Clash mobile game. Download it to your device and start unlocking the greats of yesteryear today. My narcissistic parents are angry with me for not ignoring my autistic brother's predatory behavior towards my beautiful girlfriend. My brother is 32 years old, he's never had a job, he dropped out of community college after two semesters for never doing his assignments, he's lived with my parents his entire life, he sleeps all day, and stays up all night playing video games and watching adult films. Both my brother and I 27 are diagnosed autistic and present our symptoms similarly but I've been working since I was 17, got my driver's license at 17, bought my first car at 24 and started college right after finishing high school. My parents constantly use my brother's autism as an excuse for his appalling behavior even though we're both on the spectrum. In November, I moved back in with my parents because I left an abusive relationship and had chronic health issues. Living with them hasn't been the best because my older brother is really weird and my parents coddle him a lot. It's like watching a grown man wearing a diaper and getting fed airplane style. I met my current girlfriend 23 and we've been together for a year. She's really gorgeous and sweet. Recently, she had some in mid-2021 and in early 2022 she had some extenuating circumstances where my family agreed to let her live with us. My brother was immediately pleased with this development, and behaved inappropriately really quick. It started off with him creepily staring anytime her and I kissed, which progressed to him following her into the bathroom anytime he saw her go in there for a shower until he figured out she always locked the door because of him, and the straw that broke the camel's back was him trying to come into our bedroom uninvited at 3 in the morning while we slept. Every time he behaved inappropriately we mentioned it to my parents, but all that really happened were excuses made for him because he's autistic and brief conversation with him about not doing those things again, but he still did. Whatever we wanted and my parents didn't care. After the bedroom incident, my parents fully blamed my girlfriend for what happened because my brother went to them to complain that we were being mean. They kicked my girlfriend out, making her homeless for a brief period of time, and she had a PTSD panic attack since my brother made her feel unsafe. As a result of this, my girlfriend and I got an apartment together and I moved out as well because I didn't want to be in the same house as my brother. I was upset with the way my girlfriend was treated, and I wasn't willing to break up with her, which my parents wanted me to do. I had a calm conversation with them explaining why I was moving out where I explained it's their house so they are more than entitled to make rules concerning their own home. However, I was not going to continue living somewhere my girlfriend wasn't welcome and where my brother's PR detory behavior was condoned. At first they told me they love me, they're sorry they ever made me feel that way, they want me to keep a key to the house because I'm always welcome over, and that if I ever needed to move back and I could. 
I was glad we ended on a good note, considering everything that happened. But several days later, I went over to pick up some more of my things only to find that my parents had changed the locks on the door. Later that same week they tell me they're angry with me for being ungrateful, saying I hate them, and calling them bad parents, none of which I ever said. They went on to tell me that they didn't want to speak to me for a week because they were upset, needed time to process, and because they thought I needed to feel what it was like to be cut out of the family. I respected their wishes and later my parents agreed to family therapy, which they quickly backed out of because they were only willing to do it over a three-way video call and my therapist wasn't able to do that. I told my parents I would be willing to attend family therapy with a therapist of their choice who could do the three-way video call, but that had yet to happen. That same Sunday my parents invited me over for dinner which I thought went well, only to find they would continue to dodge my calls and leave my texts on read after that night. They eventually contacted me and told me to stop using their house as storage and pick up my things, despite requesting that I stay away for a week. My girlfriend and I went over to pick up the rest of our stuff which wasn't the best idea because my brother kept staring creepily at her and making nasty comments whenever he wanted. My girlfriend was really uncomfortable but at least it was quick so she didn't have to suffer for too long. Still, my brother needs to stop doing that, especially because she's a lot younger than him. I briefly brought it up to my parents but they told me to just leave because they didn't want to deal with useless drama at the moment. I don't get why they aren't willing to talk about the issues that led to me moving out. They haven't even come over to see our new apartment after being invited over. Because, despite the circumstances, I still love them and want a relationship with them since this type of behavior is highly uncharacteristic of them. Understandably, my girlfriend isn't fond of them but told me she doesn't mind me inviting my parents over because it's important to her that I have a relationship with my parents for the sake of my mental well-being. I just don't know what to do to get them to listen. What was your most embarrassing moment? There are many such incidents but now I'm just sharing one of them. So this is not a recent incident, it happened to me almost four years ago when I was in class 10. It was the occasion of National Science Day and some inter-school competitions were organized by a science and math organization. I also participated in extempore speech. I know the competition is exciting and anxiety-inducing at the same time but since I have participated in extempore speech many times before by gathering a lot of courage, and won in some of those. So I decided to participate here also. But that day my luck didn't favor me and I got the topic zero. It was a very unexpected topic for me and I was like what should I say? I started with the line Aryabhata discovered zero and was standing in front of the mic without saying any word for a while. Since I couldn't find anything to say about zero, I just told two to three lines about Aryabhata and that's it. I just said, thank you and got off the stage. It was so embarrassing for me because the hall room was full of teachers, educationists, special guests and of course students. I think if there were less people the embarrassment would be less. After this incident I decided not to participate in extempore speech anymore. My delusional boyfriend wanted to show off how alpha he was. I think he forgot that I paid for his college so I got him expelled. I have been living with my boyfriend for less than a year, and things have been rocky to say the least. During the first week, I told him that we need to evenly split things like washing the dishes and cleaning the bathroom. But he didn't pay attention to me. If I didn't wash the dirty dishes, then they would just sit there for days. If I didn't do the laundry, then he would just keep wearing dirty clothes over and over again. I tried telling him multiple times that this wasn't the correct way to live, and that he needed to take some responsibility. But every single time his response would be, a man shouldn't have to do all these things. The thing is, I was really busy because I was balancing a job alongside my master's degree, and literally had no time to argue. It was much faster for me to just do the chores rather than ask my boyfriend to step up. I was just happy that he was paying the rent on time. But a few days ago, things changed. My master's degree was finally complete and so I was free to focus on my job and household. So I decided to have a proper talk with my boyfriend, because I didn't want to live life on the edge anymore. I told him that I needed to start taking on the duties of the house. My new job after graduation meant that I would make more than him, so we needed to switch the roles. I thought that he would agree with me, but my words angered him so much that he punched our glass table and shattered it. He completely blew up on me, calling me a woke lunatic and that I was undermining his authority by asking him to do chores. I chuckled at that and asked him, what authority? He became red in the face and said, let me show you how alpha I really am. Then he began pushing me towards the bedroom and tried to take off my clothes. I don't know what gave him the idea that I consented to this, and told him to cut it. Out. But he didn't stop, and kept saying that I'm going to service him and he's going to punish me. I called him delusional and that he had been watching too much adult films. I pushed him off me, which was surprisingly easy, and rushed to the door. I had my keys with me so I just left in my car and went to my friend's house so I could cool down. My boyfriend had literally just tried to force himself on me, and I was sure that I didn't want to stay with him after that. But I also didn't just want to break up peacefully after what he did. His complete disregard of my opinion gave me an idea. You see, around the time we had started dating, he was struggling to pay his college tuition and had asked me to help him. I agreed and paid his tuition for that semester. Well, those records had listed me as an sponsor on my boyfriend's application. So I immediately called the college harassment department and explained the situation. I told them that I wanted my money back as reimbursement for being assaulted, even though I didn't need the money at all. But that showed them that I was serious and could potentially file a report against my boyfriend. If that happened, the college's reputation would take a massive hit. While they didn't give me back my money, 
they did expel my boyfriend on the spot and banned him from reapplying in the future. He only had a semester left before he was graduated, so this shocked him to the core. Of course, the college didn't tell him that I was the one who reported him, so he had no idea and was crying on the phone with me. It turns out, the situation had escalated to the point where his workplace was notified, and he was also being fired as a result. I'm just going to stay with my friend for now, and my boyfriend will have to evict because he will run out of money for rent. So, just because he wanted to show off how alpha he was, he is now going to end up homeless and without a college degree. I have been having an affair with my hot stepfather for years. But I just realized that he groomed me and I don't know what to do. My stepfather married my mom when I was just 7 years old, so he has been in my life forever. I remember how he used to take me on playdates when my mom was busy working. He would buy me toys and clothes, and even ask me to do a fashion show for him where I wore all the clothes I liked. Whenever I had to go to a school or sports event, he would insist on driving me instead of my mom. My mom had always been too busy to pay attention to me when she was single, so I was really happy to finally get a parent who cared about me. We would often fall asleep in each other's arms while watching movies at night. He even bought me a brand new phone with his contact information already in it. At the time, I was just a little, spoiled girl who didn't realize what he was doing. He would always accompany me while doing chores like cleaning and washing dishes, and he would get really handsy. When I reached 15 years old, I began thinking that my stepfather was a very attractive man. Whenever we went out, if I left him alone then he would get approached by at least one girl asking if he was single. My friends would always comment on how handsome he was whenever I showed them his pictures. So I began feeling proud that he was my stepdad and not theirs, and even became a little possessive of him. Ever since I began thinking that, our relationship got a lot more intimate. If my mom wasn't home, we would sit in the same room and talk all day long. He would even hold my hand sometimes when I was having trouble at school. He also gave me a lot of compliments, calling me beautiful and that he wished he was my age. That being said, I never thought that our relationship would be anything more than that of a father and daughter, until I turned 18. He went all out for my 18th birthday and bought me a brand new car. He made jokes like I no longer needed him since I was now an adult, so I ended up comforting him by saying I would always need him. Little did I know, I should have never said that. A few weeks after that, my mom was out of town for a business trip and I was home alone with my stepdad. Before leaving, I had a huge argument with her where she called me spoiled and entitled, so I wasn't in a good mood. I had also been wanting to buy some new clothes for a while, so I decided to go into his room and ask him if we could go shopping. But as soon as he laid his eyes on me, he started flirting with me. He told me to sit near him on the bed, and pulled me into his arms. He began telling me how angry he was when my mother was yelling at me, and that he loved me way more than her. He talked about what I had said on my birthday, and asked if I needed him right now. I wasn't a child anymore, and knew exactly what he was doing. He was making a move on me. He was married to my mother so this was incredibly inappropriate, and I should have ran out immediately. But I was so angry at my mother that I wasn't thinking straight, and just wanted to get back at her. So I responded to his flirty advances and didn't resist when he began kissing me. That was the night when I had intimacy for the first time in my life, and it was with my stepfather. Afterwards, I didn't feel guilty at all and instead felt a satisfaction that I had never felt before. I was already thinking about doing it again the next time my mother would yell at me. The tension between me and my stepdad increased a lot, and he became even more touchy with me. He would constantly seek physical contact with me even outside of intimacy, and say that he is recharging his battery. When my mom returned, he argued with her to give me more freedom since I was an adult. To my surprise, she agreed but also said if I wanted more freedom, then I should move out. My stepdad quickly shut that down however, by claiming that it was his house and I was welcome to live in it for as long as I wanted. I was really happy he said that, and thus our relationship continued. Whenever mom wasn't home, me and stepdad would hook up in my room. We would even drop hints that we wanted to do it when my mom was at home, and almost got caught at times. I began avoiding all other boys besides him, thinking that he was all I needed. But when I turned 21, everything changed. I often watched documentaries with my friends, and they said that watching one about a criminal would be a great way to celebrate my birthday. So we did exactly that. The problem is, this documentary was about a man who had groomed his daughter. As soon as I heard the title, a shiver ran down my spine. Thankfully, my curiosity got the better of me and I ended up watching it. In the documentary, this guy had married the girl's mother when she was just 5 years old, and slept with her when she was 15. He isolated her from the world and made her think that he was the only one who cared about her. Halfway through, I was sure that my situation was just like the girl in the documentary, except the isolation part. It was terrifying how I never even realized that I was being groomed by my stepdad. All those gifts when I was younger, all those compliments, all those times we hung out with just the two of us, he was planning on sleeping with me from the start. The reality of what he had done, and the fact that I had actually helped him in cheating on my mother, it hit me all at once. I just couldn't watch anymore and ran out, ignoring my friends who were asking what was wrong. I came home and shut myself in my room, and haven't left ever since. I don't know what to do.
My heart hasn't stopped beating loudly and I am so scared. I no longer want to be with him. But I have nowhere to go. I don't have enough money to get my own place. And even if I run, I'm pretty sure that he will follow me and bring me back. My jealous friend sabotaged my car because I got a date with his crush, so I got him arrested. Me and my friend Zach have always been on good terms. But recently we have been at odds with each other due to a girl that he is interested in. She used to be in our high school and I knew that Zach always had the biggest crush on her. But since he dated other girls in college, I thought he had managed to move on without any problems. Last week, we were back in our hometown to spend our vacations here and we unexpectedly ran into her. Since we had last seen each other I had a huge growth spurt and have had more luck in my love life. She is a stunning woman and we had a great conversation catching up, so I exchanged numbers with her. But as soon as she left, Zach began arguing with me. He said that I was betraying him as he was supposed to be the one whom she gave her number to. I told him to get over it, and that his crush should have been long over. He said it didn't matter, and I needed to honor the bro code and not make any moves on her. I told him to get over it and grow up. He tried to snatch my phone from me but I pushed him away and drove away in my car. The next day, I texted her the next day. I very clearly asked her if she had any feelings for Zach just in case. She told me no, and that she was only interested in me because she thought I had a unique sense of humor, and she didn't have an opinion about my friend. After that, I was very relieved and asked her out on a date, to which she said yes. I was pretty excited and called my friend to talk about it. Zach had a lot of experience and I wanted to get his advice on where to take her. But contrary to my expectations, when I told him about it he told me to go F myself and hung up on me. I admit I was angry, but I held it in and decided to deal with him after the said date. In the end, I planned to take her out to a bowling alley and then went to sleep. As I was getting ready the next day, I noticed that something had happened to my wonderful car. I ran outside in a hurry and fell on the ground in shock. Zach had thought it would be funny to deflate all four tires of my car. He also decided to smear dog poop on the passenger side window, completely ruining my chances of going on the date. I hurriedly sent him a voice note, asking if he really was the one who did this. Zach what the F? Why the hell would you do this to me? And he replied very violently, saying F you. You are the worst friend I ever had. You knew I liked the girl and yet you stole her from me on purpose. Did you really think I would let you walk away harmless? I was really bummed out after that, because honestly I thought our friendship was stronger than this. Besides, I wasn't trying to steal anything from anyone. If she had shown any interest in Zach, I would have backed off. I reluctantly texted the girl and cancelled our plans. But when I told her about what happened, she got really excited for some reason. Apparently, her dad was a cop and she wanted to help me by reporting Zach. I was hesitant at first because I didn't want to get my friend arrested. But then she convinced me that destroying my car is actually a crime. I also wasn't too happy about Zach texting other friends and calling me a backstabber, so I filed a police report and provided the voice texts from him as proof that he was the one who did this. I don't know what she told her dad, but Zach was arrested on literally the same day. He used his one phone call to call one of our mutual friends instead of a lawyer. Now a lot of people are telling me that I was too harsh and shouldn't have gone to the police since this was just friendly banter. Did I do the wrong thing? What's a cold case that even the FBI couldn't solve? The disappearance of Asha Degree. Asha Jack Willa Degree 13 was born on August 5, 1990. She was the only daughter of Harold and Aquila Degree and had a brother, O'Brien, who was one year older than her. They lived in a rented two-bedroom duplex at 3404 Oak Crest Drive, located in a quiet residential neighborhood about five miles north of Shelby, North Carolina. Asha is described as a happy, shy, and athletic little girl who took after her father's quiet personality and was extremely close with her older brother. On Saturday, February 12th, Asha attended a slumber party at her cousin's house. Back at home, Asha, who hadn't gotten much sleep at the slumber party, dozed off at about 6.30 p.m. Two hours later, she was awakened by a thunderstorm that just rolled into the area and went to the living room to watch TV with her parents and brother. Just before 9 p.m., a motorist crashed into a utility pole in Lawndale, knocking out power to swaths of northern Cleveland County. Iquila, who was preparing a shower for the kids when the lights went out, decided to leave it for the morning and sent both of them to bed. At 11.30 p.m., Harold stepped out for a last-minute trip to buy some Valentine's Day candy. Tomorrow would be his and Aquila's 12th wedding anniversary, the two planned to spend the day alone at home. He returned shortly after and fell asleep on the couch. When the power returned at 12.30 a.m., Aquila woke Harold up and asked him to move their kerosene lamp before going back to bed. Now wide awake, Harold settled on the couch to watch TV for the next two hours. At 2.30 a.m., he checked on Asha and O'Brien, found them sleeping peacefully in their beds, and went to join Aquila in their bedroom. Sometime during the night, O'Brien stirred and heard Asha moving around in her bed. He thought she was tossing and turning in her sleep, then heard her get up and apparently go to the bathroom. Reports differ on whether he ever heard her return. That night, unbeknownst to her family, Asha would grab her backpack, slip out of the house, and start walking south on Highway 18. They would never see her again. Iquila woke up at 5.45 a.m. to start the shower, and later walked into the kids' room to find O'Brien asleep in Asha's bed unmade and empty. Thinking she just got up early, Iquila went downstairs to the kitchen expecting to see her there, but couldn't find her. Now concerned, she began searching the house and realized that Asha's book bag and house key were gone. Harold suggested that she went to her grandma's house across the street, but when Iquila called, she said she hadn't seen her either. Iquila started running up and down the street, screaming Asha's name. 
Harold called the police at 6.39 a.m. by 6.45. Sheriff Dan Crawford and officers from the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office had converged on the degree home and were scouring the neighborhood. Over the next few hours, dozens of volunteers, search and rescue personnel, bloodhounds, and investigators from the Sheriff's Office and State Bureau of Investigation, SBI, poured in to comb the surrounding area. The SBI taped off the degree home at 2 p.m. They found no signs of forced entry at the scene and were unable to tell if she had left through the front or back door, both of which could be opened from the inside without a key. There was no evidence of foul play inside the home. Asha is believed to have been wearing a white shirt, white jeans, and white Nike tennis shoes. She did not bring a coat or hat with her, but an inventory of her belongings found that she had taken the following items, a black Tweety Bird pocketbook candy she received at her basketball game on Saturday night, her house key, a red vest, blue jeans, a white nylon long sleeve shirt, a black and white long sleeve shirt, and black overalls with Tweety Bird on it. That afternoon, Jeff R., a 25-year-old trucker for Sun Drop Bottling Company, was eating lunch when he saw Asha's face on the TV. He instantly recognized her as the child he had seen walking in the rain along Highway 18 at 3.30 that morning, about a mile south of Asha's home. He called the police and said, I seen a little girl walking down the road with her book bag. She had on a little dress and white tennis shoes, and her hair was in pigtails. I went back, but she never did look up at me. She looked like she knew where she was going. She was walking at a pretty good pace. Realizing it was a child, Jeff stopped and turned his 10-wheeler around. In total, he circled around three times before the girl ran into the woods and out of sight. At 4.15 a.m., Roy B., a former deputy at the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office, was trucking northbound on Highway 18 with his son when they saw a small person walking down the road. It was a small figure wearing light-colored clothing. I thought it was a woman. I couldn't tell it was a child. I thought that maybe it was a domestic violence thing where a woman left the house and was out walking. Roy placed the sighting 1.3 miles south of Asha's home, just before the intersection of Highways 18 and 180. Concerned that she would get run over, they sent a message over the CB radio for other truckers to be on the lookout, but they didn't stop for her. Instead, they made a stop in Falston before driving up to Chicago, where he learned about Asha's disappearance during a phone call with his wife. The next day, the men returned to Shelby and went straight to the command post at Mall's Memorial Baptist Church to report the sighting in person. The SBI and FBI have always believed these sightings to be legitimate. Armed with this new information, they began combing a five-mile radius around the intersection of Highways 18 and 180. An air search by Highway Patrol and the SBI turned up empty. There were no signs of a struggle or hit and run. Driver checkpoints set up on February 15 and 21st failed to turn up any leads. Bloodhounds began to scour the area within one and a half hours of Harold's 911 call but never caught her scent, likely due to the inclement weather. That night, Aquila and Harold were interviewed by the SBI and quickly ruled out as suspects. Detectives say that the degrees have always been cooperative with the investigation and have bent over backwards to help find their daughter. They allowed authorities to search their home and insisted on a polygraph, which they passed. As Sheriff Crawford put it, there was no, and is no, evidence whatsoever to indicate this mother or father or child are responsible for this child's disappearance. On February 15, some volunteers approached Raleigh and Debbie Turner, who lived almost exactly one mile south of the degree home, and asked them to check their property for any sign of Asha. They owned an old, doorless outbuilding that stood about 300 feet from the road, which they used to store furniture and supplies for their upholstery business. When they checked the shed, they found an odd assortment of items, a green marker, a 1996 Atlanta Olympics pencil, a yellow hair bow, some cellophane candy wrappers, and a wallet-sized photo of a little girl. After being questioned and polygraphed by the FBI, Jeff went back to the scene with investigators and pointed out a spot 600 feet from the Turner's field. Raleigh and Debbie handed over the photograph but kept the other items neatly piled on their porch, assuming that they lived too far away for them to belong to Asha. Reverend Mackie Turner, a neighbor who kept his six beagles in a dog lot behind the shed, said that his dogs normally barked if anyone approached but that he didn't hear anything that night. Another neighbor reported nothing suspicious, either. Volunteers asked the Turners about some candy wrappers found on the road near their home. At that point, they turned the other items over to the police. No one in Asha's family or at school knew the girl in the photo, but they quickly identified the other items as hers. Her friends stated that the candies came from a treat bag they received at their basketball games. Investigators would find no further evidence after this. On February 20th, after three days of unsuccessful searching, they suspended the official search.